Am I going to die before I finally choose to care about others? And that's a, that's a great question because all of you in here have the ability to answer that question the right way and say, no, I'm not going to wait till I die. I'm still alive and I'm still breathing, so I still can choose to care for other people. And that's what this passage is about today. Go to John chapter number 5. And uh, if you, we've, we've still got the church Bibles, you know, so you can still use those. They're under your chair now instead of in front there. And every other chair has a church Bible. So you can reach under the chair or the one next to you and grab a church Bible. And it's page number 1102. And that's always on the top of the handout. We put the, uh, the church Bible page number. At Crossroads, we want to learn the Bible, live the Bible. So we want you to see it in the Word of God. So if you don't have a copy of God's Word, always feel free to grab the church Bible underneath your chair there. And in John chapter 5, I want to begin reading in verse 1 to kind of get the context. Let's, let's look at it. Verse number 1. It says, uh, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So he's going for a feast day to observe it. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five uh, porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. We'll explain what that means in a moment, but I just want to stop there for a minute and I want you to get the picture. I want you to imagine the pool of Bethesda, which was close to the temple there at Jerusalem, is where you're at. And up here on the shore, if you will, there's five gigantic porches, the Bible says, and all, laying all underneath them are people with severe physical handicaps. You know, I read that, and it says there's a great multitude of impotent folk. And, I, and I'm reminded of the fact that now and today, there are a lot of hurting people in the world. Some have physical disabilities, some are scarred by abuse, some have been completely crushed by guilt, some suffer from mental depression or despair, others carry a heavy load because of just really just some sinful and wrong choices that they've made in their past that they can't undo, but nevertheless, those things happen. That's the indication of the guy that we're going to meet today in this story. The indication of Scripture is that he'd made some really bad choices in his life, leading him uh, to where he was at. But, you know, in, in verse number four, uh, it, it, there's some hope here. I want you to look at it with me. Verse number four, it says, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. You say, Pastor Dan, I don't get it. Why did God do that? And here's why I believe God probably did that. This was Jerusalem. This was by the temple. This is where the Messiah, the King of heaven, the Bible prophesied that one day the Messiah would come down and he would bring a kingdom from heaven down to this earth. And when he brought that, that kingdom to earth, he would rule and reign over the earth as King of Kings. His center of his kingdom would be right there in Jerusalem, right here by this pool. And, I, and when he came, it was prophesied that he would wipe out all sickness for his people. And then all that would be done away. He would heal them and that they would, there would be no sickness. And I think that God probably did this thing with the angel every so often as a constant reminder to his people of his promise, to give them a foretaste of what they could expect when the Messiah would come so that they would be looking for him, so that they would be anticipating his arrival. And the point, though, that I really want to make here. Is, is this, and that is that in your handout, it says hurting people are looking for hope. I mean, there's just people everywhere here. Why? They're looking for hope. And by the way, that's why certain people make certain decisions. Maybe you've got a family member, a cousin, an, a niece, a nephew, a friend from high school, and you're like, I don't, oh man, they're destroying their life. I don't know why they're doing that. Why are they destroying their life that way? Why are they making those decisions? And what I want you to know is that Hurting people look for hope. And many times they look in the wrong places. They look to drugs, or they look to alcohol, or they look to, to uh, you know, gangs. And they, you know, they join a gang, they're, or they're, they look, unfortunately, to things like prostitution, illicit sexual relationships. 
Then other people turn to things looking for hope in money, in possessions. They think if I could just have more, I'll have hope. You know, they look to hobbies. They look, some people look to false religion to try to give them hope. Why? People are looking for hope. People are looking for hope. And by the way, let me just mention if, because uh, I've, I've had a few people mention, if you've got a child, that's great. We want to encourage you to bring your kids in. But if they start to disrupt, if you could, we've got some overflow areas and stuff, and you can hear in the foyer too. Just people really want to listen. They want to be able to hear. So I just wanted you to, to just be respectful of those around you, okay? But uh, people are looking for hope. And if you look at verse number three, look at it with me. It says, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered. And then notice this, waiting, waiting for the moving of the water. And you know, I read that and I'm like, that's, that's so many people. They're waiting for something to change. It's like they don't even really know what it is that they want to change. They just need something in their life to change. They're waiting and they're hoping, just like these people, just like these people. And I thought, how can we as believers in Christ, how can we give hope to hurting people? Because listen, <laughs> let me tell you something. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, I want you to know something. We are a people of hope. The Bible says, Clayton mentioned it. He said, we've, we've got Christ, the hope of glory, living inside of us. We have a hope which is laid up for us in heaven. We have the, the blessed hope and the glorious return of our Savior who's going to take us to heaven with him one day. The Bible says that, that, that we have a hope that is an anchor of the soul. And, and I'm thinking, okay, if there are people out there that don't know God, they don't know Jesus Christ, they literally feel like they have no hope at all. Who, is the one, who are the ones that are going to take them hope? Who are the ones that are going to let them know that they do have hope in Jesus Christ? Let me tell you something, folks. If it isn't us, who's going to do it? I believe that God can use every one of us in this room that know the Lord. We can be channels of hope to hurting people if we let God use us. We can be channels of hope. And by the end of this message, you're going to know how. You know, and, and you know, some of us are like, man, I'm, I'm hurting. I'm going to tell you something right now that that. There is no greater way to overcome your hurts than to use your hurts to help somebody else. Help someone else. And this passage is about Jesus. And it's how he helped a hurting man. And it's going to be really practical. And this message is something that you can literally put into practice tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, you don't have to wait three weeks. You can get at this today. It's going to be so simple. The first principle is this we learn from Jesus is that if we're going to help hurting people, if we're going to give them hope, number one, we got to go where they are. If you look at verse five, we're going to meet a man here. Look at verse five. This is one of the guys around the pool. A certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and eight years. Okay, so this guy's been sick 38 years. Now, look at verse number six. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, wilt thou be made whole? And, and i tell you what really struck me about this is that Jesus Christ is heading to the temple. I, I, I want to kind of show you. Imagine you got the impotent folk up here and imagine you got this guy here. You got that for me? The, and I, I brought in a bedroll here. So let me get this. All right, got my bedroll. All right. Now, this guy is laying here by the pool of Bethesda. Literally, all he's got to his name is a bedroll. And so he's laying here on this bedroll, and Jesus Christ is coming, and he's heading to the temple to observe a feast day. And so Jesus has somewhere to go and something to do. And this guy is laying here on this bedroll, and Jesus Christ could have had tunnel vision, and he could have just kept right on heading to the temple. But he didn't do that. What I want you to notice in the text is that Jesus Christ, the Bible says, this is what is so cool. Instead of having tunnel vision and just you know, barreling full step, steam ahead to the, to the temple, not only does he walk by this area where all these hurting people are, where most people would have avoided them, Jesus Christ not only walks by, he sees the man. He sees him. And Jesus Christ then goes over and he begins to engage the man in conversation. And I thought, man, isn't that precious that Jesus Christ had time 
for this one certain man. He could have gone to the temple and he could have spoke to masses of people, but instead, Jesus Christ spent time on one certain man. Jesus went where the man was. The man had no strength to come where Jesus was. Jesus would have never encountered the man. And, and, and I got to tell you, I'm bad about tunnel vision. I'm type A. Man, I want to get things done. I got my to-do list. I got my list of stuff I want to get accomplished today. And I'm bad about that. And if I've ever barreled by you, I didn't do it on purpose. All right, I'm serious. I don't want to ever hurt people. So if I've ever kind of barreled by you with tunnel vision, that's an issue for me. That's a problem. I pray about it all the time. That God would help me to see things around me. Because I do, I get that way. And uh, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's, it's something I pray about and work on. It's a problem, you know. And it's like Jesus Christ, if he'd have got tunnel vision and he would have not even seen that guy right there and he just kept right on going to the temple over here. Think about this. Would he have ever met that man, yes or no? No, why? Because this man was crippled. He had no way of getting to the temple. So had Jesus gone straight to the temple, this man would have never met Jesus Christ. Jesus had to go right where he was. He didn't have any strength to get to Jesus. So what's the lesson for us and for our church? The lesson is this. We tend to think ministry has to happen on church property. Can I tell you something right now? Some of the most powerful ministry takes place off church property out in the community. That's where it's happening is out there. That's the mission field out there. You know, we're, we always think everything has to be on church. We're gonna have a Bible study. Let's do it on church property. We're gonna have an activity. Let's do it on church property. We're gonna have this event. Let's do it on church property. Everything we wanna do right here. But folks, we need to get out in the community. We've got a lady in our church that lost her mother two years ago. And they called her Mimi, her, all the grandkids. And her, I knew her mom very well. <laughs> and, and this lady in our church is named Jamie Williams. And she's, her mother was so precious, so full of the love of Jesus. And she said she gave the best hugs. And so when her mother died, she kept asking the Lord what she could do in her mom's memory to make an impact. And so she began a ministry with teddy bears. And that lady's go, oh, yeah. And she began a ministry with teddy bears called Hugs from Mimi. And they got a little card on here, and it says Hugs from Mimi. It's got prayers. It's got Bible verses. It's quite a testimony for the Lord. And what she did is she purchased these bears, okay? She bought these bears and began to take them to children at Halifax Hospital that were in the hospital. In fact, I've got a few pictures here. There, there she took them to a homeless shelter and gave away 39 bears to kids that were homeless at Christmas time. She went to a shelter. Here you see some pictures. Go ahead. We can run through those. There's the little boy with his. Oh, slow down a little bit. Go back. All right. Yeah, you see the little boy. He's got his bears in the hospital. Go to the next one. You, it's kind of hard to see. It's a little dark, but she's, she's holding her bear and uh, it's a girl in the hospital, and you go to the next one, it's kind of got pictures of a bunch of different ones. You want to hear something exciting? In just two years, she's given away 1,600 bears to children. Jamie Williams, a member of our church. Aren't you proud of that church? Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen? Amen. That's awesome. And uh, I was talking to Jamie this week. She was updating me on how the ministry was going. And uh, she said, I could use some help. She said, I need a couple ladies to help me. You know, it's really grown, the ministry. And she said, if a couple ladies would help me with the delivery, she said, that'd be awesome. She said, if any of the ladies know how to sew, she said, some of the bears come in, they've got a little rip in the seam or a little hole, and I don't want to give them out that way. So she said, I got a pile of bears that just need a little mending. She said, if anyone wants to help. What a powerful ministry. This is ministry taking place off church property in the community. You say, well, I don't know if I could do anything like that. Oh, no, no, there's something you can do. There's a ministry for you. What is it? I don't know. Maybe it's a, a particular hobby, you know, that you like, that you can connect with people with. Uh, I don't know, but she said she prayed and prayed, and God gave her that idea, you know. And so I would encourage you, think in terms of that. Do you know what a minister, we need a lot of ministers. You say, what's a minister? Minister is Pastor Dan. No. 
What is a minister? All right, I'm going to give you a very deep, profound definition. A minister is someone who ministers. Y'all want to write that down, right? That's so good. What a nugget. Thanks, Pastor Dan. That was such a great nugget. A minister is someone who ministers. Is Jamie Williams a minister? Yes or no? Oh, yeah. She's ministering to children. A minister is someone who ministers. It's someone who cares and has the heart of Jesus. Jesus reached this man by meeting a core need in his life, and it was after he met Jesus that he went to the temple. That's a lesson, is that we have to go to the hurting people. We can't expect them to come to us. Jesus' attitude couldn't be, well, I'm, you know, hey, uh, you folks up here, uh, I'm Jesus Christ, I'm the Messiah, I'm heading to the temple. If, if you want something, maybe I'll help you over here. You guys got to get to the temple. He couldn't get to the temple. Jesus had to go where he was. And there are people in our community that, yes, we have a church. Yes, we have three services on Sunday and one on Sunday night. Yes, we have all that. But there are many people, they don't have this, in their hurting condition, they may not have the strength to seek us. We have to seek them. We have to reach where they are. Some of you are at the park this week. We met Someone this week invited him to church at the park. We took land into the park. I guarantee you there'll be people there that are hurting. A neighbor, the prisons, the hospitals, workplace. Hurting people are everywhere. And you know what? They may never come to our church. You're going to have to reach them where they are. The first lesson we learn is that we have to go where they are. Number two, second thing is this. Number two, we have to care enough to ask questions. I want you to notice the first thing Jesus does when he meets the man. All right, let's go back to verse six. Everybody go back to verse six. It says, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Notice he doesn't lecture him on who he is. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Son of God. I've come down from heaven, and you need to have faith, and you need to believe in me. The first words out of Jesus' mouth are a question. He says, wilt thou be made whole? The first words are a question, and then he lets that man talk. And I thought, man, what this kind of convicted me too. I was telling Denise, you know, is, is that... Questions are such a great icebreaker when it comes to reaching people and showing people that we care. Did you know that Jesus asked questions all the time? Did you know that there are 300 questions recorded? There's probably a lot more. 300 questions recorded that Jesus asked people. 300, just that are recorded in his public ministry. He was asked 187 questions and he only answered a handful of those. Jesus was the supreme question asker. Why? Because he cared. He cared. Try that approach. You know, you meet someone. Hey, do you have something that you need me to pray for? Do you go to church anywhere? Um, tell me, you got any spiritual beliefs? Do you believe in heaven or hell? What do you think happens when we die? Would you like to know that you're in a right relationship with God? Questions. Ask questions. Where are you from? <laughs> you know? It doesn't even have to be something spiritually related. Hey, where are you from? You know? Were you raised here? Ask questions. Great icebreaker. As you ask questions, you begin to learn where people are at and how you can help them. How you can help them. How you can show that you care. How you can guide them to truth that will help them. The third thing is this. Number three you got to care enough to ask questions, but number three, got to take time to listen. <laughs> you ever been talking to somebody and you can tell that they're trying to think of what they're going to say next? You ever talk to someone and you're talking while they're thinking of what they're going to say next? Isn't that great? You can tell they're not hearing a word you're saying. <laughs> they're just thinking about what they're going to say next. They're not listening to a word you're saying. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus asked the man, he says, Will you be made whole? And then he just lets the guy talk. In your handout, it says, Jesus just let him talk, and Jesus just listened. Look at verse number seven. All right, let's all turn there. Look at verse number seven. 
It says, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. So obviously the guy's crippled, right? He can't walk. He says, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Now I want you to keep in mind, this guy does not know Jesus Christ at all. He has no clue who he's talking to. That's clear later on in the text. He doesn't even know Jesus' name. He just opens up and he starts talking to Jesus who is a total stranger to him. A lot of people will open up if anybody would show any signs of caring. This guy had nobody. He's like, he's like I have no man. And I, I thought, that's so sad. Jesus says, will you be made whole? He's like, I got nobody. I got nobody. I got nobody to help me. I have no man. I am alone and I got nobody. He needed a friend. You know, friend day is next week. I want to encourage you to invite some friends to come to church. And some of you said have already been bringing friends. And, I've, you know, some people are like, well, I, you know what? I've been saved a long time. I don't, I, all my friends go to church. You know? And you know what my answer to that is? Make some new friends. <laughs> you know it doesn't take long. We were at Ritter's the other day and made friends with a lady. There ain't no better place to make friends than over ice cream, amen? <laughs> we were at Ritter's, made friends with a lady. Good friends, you know? And man, we just, we just hit it off. Invited her to church, she was so excited. Made friends with our waitress. I don't know if she's here right now. I don't know if you've seen her, Kaylee. Uh, but she, she came to church, you know? We just made friends with her. It's awesome. You know, sometimes, <laughs> have you ever noticed sometimes we're too quick to talk? Anybody else notice that? Anybody else have that problem besides me? All right. We're just too quick to talk. You know, but the Bible teaches we ought to be slow to talk, quick to listen. Look, look in your handout. I want to show you a verse, James 1, 19. It says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Wow. Shoo. How many of you in here, that just kind of hit you right here? It's like, whoa. Sometimes we just got to let people talk. And when you let people talk, you find out how you can really help them if you just listen. Many times I think we're hesitant to share our faith in Christ. And you know what the number one reason is? I think most Christians want to share their faith. It's just, you know what the number one reason is why people don't share their faith? Is they're deathly afraid someone's going to ask them a question they won't know the answer to. So you know what my answer to that is? You be the one to ask the questions. You ask the questions. And when you ask the questions, let them, you got to listen though, let them answer. And that way you can kind of find out where they're at spiritually. And that way you can kind of do your homework on how you can figure out the best way to, to help them, best way to reach them and to help them for Christ. For example, somebody says to you, I, I don't, you know, you say, what do you believe? Do you believe there's a heaven and hell? And they're like, no, nah, I don't believe in heaven and hell. What do you think happens when we die? I think when you die, you die. That's it. And then you're like, okay, all right. Well, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, I believe he existed. That's obvious. There's historical proof of that. Um, what do you think about him? Well, I think he was a good man. I mean, everything written about him, he was a good man. I think he was a good, I don't know that he was the son of God, but they say to you, I think he was a good man. Well, now you know what to go on, Right. They believe Jesus is a good man. So I go to the, now what I do is I leave them. I'm able to do my homework. And I go to my Bible and I look up all the places where Jesus talked about heaven and hell. And that way I can go back and say, hey, you know, I was thinking about what we talked about. And we both think Jesus was a good man, right? Right. But you don't believe in heaven or hell. No, I don't. Well, you know, I got to thinking about that after we left. And you know, Jesus talked over and over about heaven and hell. Let me show you some verses. If Jesus was a good man, I don't, I don't think he would have made that up. Good men don't make up lies like that. See, now you know how to talk to him. You know how to, you ask the questions because that way you can find out how you can help people. But you got to care. You got to care enough to ask questions. You got you to be willing to listen. 
But then the last thing is this. Number four, share the hope of Jesus. What was the answer for this man? Can everybody look down at verse eight? Everybody look down at verse eight. I want everybody to tell me on the count of three, what is the first word of verse number eight? One, two, three, Jesus. Jesus was the only hope for this man. This man had no hope outside of Jesus Christ, but yet a single word from Christ does everything. Look at verse number eight. Jesus saith unto him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Boom, strength is imparted, the man rises, and he goes away carrying his bedroll. Look at verse 9. Immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. He had to have help outside of himself. Somebody who cared, but then someone who had the power to help him. And the same is true spiritually of every person on the earth. What cripples people today? I'm going to tell you what really cripples people. What really cripples us in our heart and our soul is when people forget God and people go their own way instead of God's way. And there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It brings death to your heart and soul. Maybe not physical death, but it kills everything good in your life when you try to do it your way instead of God's way. And we've all been there. Can I get an amen? We've all been there. How many of us have been separated from God by wicked thoughts and wicked deeds? How many of us have been separated? All of us. That's right. How many of us have sinned? All of us. We've all messed up. But I got some great news, church. Jesus bridged the gap between us and God. And, and, and you think about this. Jesus Christ made it possible, just like he healed that man, Jesus Christ has made it possible to have the healing of our sin-sick souls, our hearts, inner healing, which is so much more important even than physical healing. We cannot bring healing to ourselves and our heart and our soul. We can't bring forgiveness. We can't bring that restoration and that reconciliation with God. We're just like this man. We're, we're crippled by our sin. We can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. That's why Jesus came to this earth. Jesus said, I came to heal the brokenhearted. And he said, I came to set the captives free. And in your handout, it says this, Romans 5, 6. I love this verse. For when we were, notice this, for when we were yet without what? Strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. This man on the bedroll here, he'd been living under a performance-based system. You know what the performance-based system was? Think about it. If you're strong enough, smart enough, fast enough, and better than the others, you might be made whole. And that left him empty because he could never do enough. Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus represents grace. Jesus does it all for him and immediately he's made whole, takes up his bed, and walks. He is a new man. Jesus Christ comes, and out of sheer grace, I mean, he does everything for the guy. He says, hey, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And man, I mean, this, I mean, can't, wouldn't you love to have been there? This guy's laying here like this, has no idea who he's talking to, none whatsoever. Jesus says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. There you go, honey. <laughs> hey, man. Wouldn't you love to have been there, huh? I almost took a tumble again, didn't I, honey? I know a lot of you, I was the talk last afternoon, right? Last week when I did my famous, woo. <laughs> but this guy, that's grace. Would you all agree with me what Jesus did was grace, amen? I mean... Religion said, think about this. This guy's a stone's throw from the temple. Temple religion had done nothing for this man. Religion, I'm going to tell you what religion says. Religion keeps you on that treadmill. Religion says, do, walk, crawl, struggle, strain, and then maybe you'll be made whole. 
Jesus Christ in grace says, I will make you whole. Boom, you are now delivered. You are now saved. So now you can get up and walk and go and do. In your handout, I'm gonna end with this. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. How am I saved? Through, through works or through grace? Grace. grace. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. And what's the next three words? Not of works. Lest any man should what? Boast. Could this man boast that he healed himself, yes or no? None. He had no boasting in himself. His only boast was in Jesus. The only way for you to be saved today is to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, period. Coming to our church for a year won't save you. Joining the church won't save you. Being baptized won't save you. Being religious won't save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. And the moment you trust him, boom, just like that man, boom, you are saved. You become God's child. And then look at the rest of the verse. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto, now what's he enable us to do? Good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He saves us by grace. Then he enables us to go and do. The message that we've been given is to share with people, listen to me, there is so much power in this room right now. There is so much incredible potential in this room right now under the sound of my voice to go out and to make a difference in your world. And the message we have to share is a message of grace. It's a message of hope. It's a message of peace. It's a message of reconciliation. It's a, it's a message of, of, of sheer grace. It's good news. And yes, there are people out there with questions and doubts. That's okay. Listen, respect the process. Probably most of you in here, you did not get saved and trust Christ the first time you ever heard the gospel, right? You were seeking for a while before you finally got saved. So respect that process. Listen, ask questions, listen, get the conversation going, talk to them, show them you care, and respect that process that they're going through as they seek the Lord, there are people that are going to have questions and doubts. Don't be intimidated by that. You probably did too at one time. There are people that have been completely blinded by Satan's world system. That's okay. But you know what? There are many hurting people out there that are looking for answers. And in your handout, it says they will gladly embrace the message of Jesus Christ if somebody will share it with them if somebody will just share it with them God can use you to help hurting people he really can and you know what God uses you want to you want to hear something really cool you want to know what God will many times use the most in our lives to help other people our own hurts because we can associate with what they're going through and instead of those hurts destroying us, we use our hurts to help other people. And when you look back in your life at the biggest hurts, and we all have them, we could all stand up and talk about all the hurts we've been through. That's life. We're all going to have those. And when you look at the hurts in your life, those are the things that God will use the most to be able to reach other people and to show them that you care.